night on First Tuesday. If you're depressed, if you give up, you're going to not do well. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. New ways of staying alive. And the men waiting to die. If I can beat the electric chair, I will. Good evening. Tonight, two ways to fight off a death sentence. Later, how the prisoners on Virginia's death row argue desperately to stave off their execution dates. But first, another bid for life, a new treatment for the West's biggest killers, heart disease and cancer. Most of us believe in the link between mind and body, the belief that mental stress is hard on your heart and that great grief and trauma can weaken your defences against an illness like cancer. Now, American doctors and scientists have begun to ask whether, if the mind causes heart disease, it can also cure it, and whether mental attitudes can help to extend the life of cancer patients. Their research indicates a whole new dimension to 21st century medicine. Thank you, University Five Okay, US Five, give me a location on that shooting, please. Newark, New Jersey. Okay, University Fire received that, thank you. Midnight, the first shooting victim for the night shift. Oh my god. Oh my fucker. You'll be alright, guy. Relax. Expert emergency care from hospital medics. Other staff, like nurse and counsellor Joan Moynihan, will help calm the casualties. But Newark scientists don't only care for the casualties. They also want to know how relatives cope, how they face up to the shock of seeing their loved ones in such pain. Could such shock to your mind seriously damage the health of your body? That's what the scientists have been asking. Their answers may help change the face of medicine as we know it. We look at family members of a patient who has suffered a traumatic injury. Typically, these are individuals who are involved in a car accident or perhaps a, a, a victim of some violent crime like a gunshot or a knifing. And the family members have just been notified that this has occurred to one of their loved ones. Here's your sisters. Okay? Okay. All right? It's gotta be okay. okay. It's hard to see you like this, you know? You know, she's not used to seeing you like this, right? Yeah. Dr. Keller's team have been checking the effects of mental shock and trauma on the immune system. This is the guardian of our health, our own chemical defense system. Magnified 20,000 times, this is the strange world of the immune system. A vast network of cells designed to track and destroy the enemy cells that bring illness, disease and death. The immune system has its own memory. It's even been described as our sixth sense, talking to our brain. If it fails completely, as can happen with AIDS, we die. A mild or not severe decreases of immunity might lead to what we might consider trivial um, diseases, instances of colds or the flu. Um, but as the immune system gets more and more impaired or, or drops lower and lower, more important and more severe sort of diseases seem to occur. And as the immune system 
really bottoms out, we get increased, dramatic increases in cancers and, and infections and, and life-threatening diseases and death. I just, I, you know, like you don't be sure. You don't want to be sure. You don't want it to be him. And it was. Somebody had shot him. Over the past year, Newark staff have met and interviewed loved ones of casualty cases to see how they're coping with the trauma. Blood samples are analysed using the latest technology to check if the trauma is damaging the immune system. The results are disturbing. Preliminary results from the study have indicated that family members of trauma victims suffer an almost immediate change in certain immune parameters. And these are the immune system components which are required and vitally needed to fight off cancer. And it seems that this decrease in this cancer-fighting component of the immune system seems to revert back to normal as the patient seems to improve and the family members adjust to this traumatic event. We are following long-term those family members whose, patient, whose loved one does not survive. And data indicate that these people may suffer the greatest immune impairment and actually have more disease than those who have recovered. So Dr. Keller's tests show relatives of casualty victims could at worst be in danger of getting cancer. But, okay, but it never really it goes never, away. Never goes away. Other scientists have shown that if you lose a loved one, for a time you face an increased risk of death yourself. But why? It could be because the shock weakens the immune system. Dr. Keller and his colleagues studied the husbands of women who died of breast cancer. Their immune systems took a dramatic turn for the worse and then took a year or two to normalize. And what are the risks of everyday depression? We have found in other studies that people who are just mildly depressed, that is you and I who have had um, perhaps a few weeks of bad experiences and who are generally feeling down and blue, we have shown that there is a relationship between the level of feeling depressed and the depression of immunity. And again, let me emphasize, this is just in normal people walking around. If you're depressed, if you give up, you're going to not do well. You're going to get sick. You're going to die. And if you're a fighter, you may actually do better. These are notions which have been around for years and decades and, and, and generations. And today, psychoimmunology really is, is a, giving a scientific understanding to these notions. The more we discover about the brain, the more we find out about the chemistry of feeling. When we feel things, all kinds of chemicals are released into the blood, the body's own liquid pills. Critics of modern medicine say it turns us into passive patients who just take the medicine. But if the mind affects the body so deeply, all that could change as we move into the 21st century. If the physician can liberate the patient from the depression that generally follows a a serious diagnosis, uh, he can set a stage for the body's own pharmacy to come into play, and that can be very substantial. You see, the human brain is not just the seat of consciousness. The human brain is a gland. Uh, the human brain is a, can manufacture uh, dozens of chemicals needed by the body. Uh, at the Brain Research Institute here in, uh, at UCLA, for example, we discovered that the three dozen basic secretions produced by the brain could actually be combined and that you could have thousands of secretions uh, produced by the brain as prescriptions to meet the needs of the needs of the body. We need to have confidence in ourselves uh, and not to recognize that uh, any pain uh, means that we're in the grip of an irreversible disease. American medical science is coming up with more and more evidence of this human pharmacy. For the last 18 months in San Francisco, Dwayne Butler has been part of an astonishing scientific trial. Can heart disease, the West's number one killer, be reversed with no drugs and no surgery? It's never been done before. If you would have uh, mentioned to me a year, year and a half ago that I'd be doing what I'm doing today, I'd have told you you're crazy. I, uh, I'm now in uh, uh, relaxation, stress management. I'm a uh, totally different uh, diet. I uh, do a lot of exercising. And if you'd have told me 
that some time ago, I uh, told you you were nuts. That wasn't my type of program at all. I didn't think I could do it, number one. And uh, I just felt that uh, uh, it was for the crazies. I was afraid of dying. I, I hadn't ever had that fear before. And when I found out I had 90% blockage in my heart, uh, I decided it was time that I had to do something. Just across from Alcatraz, an unlikely setting for what may herald a medical revolution in the treatment of heart disease. Each week, Duane and other heart patients meet here for a group session. The research is funded partly by the US National Institute of Health. But what do they do, and does it really work? 120 over 82. It's fine. Thanks. The man behind this lifestyle program, Dr. Dean Ornish, a highly qualified medic with all the right credentials, now an associate professor at the University of San Francisco. Many people here believe they owe him their lives. A little bit higher, 128 over 78. Oh, well, I've been exercising. Well, that's not bad. Each exhalation again, just notice the effect on the body. The program uses meditation one hour a day as part of stress management. Chosen at random, these patients have been compared with a control group who were just as ill but only got conventional treatment. The control group got worse, but this group's got astonishingly better. Four out of five have reduced the blockages in their arteries. The program has other physical components. Patients must keep to a very strict low-fat diet. Each day they must do an hour's yoga and an hour's walking. Oh, Dr. Ornish says it all works, but only if you work on your mind. The mind plays a critically important role in heart disease, and it's important for two reasons. One, of course, is it's the mind that determines what lifestyle choices that we make on a daily basis, whether or not we smoke, what we eat, whether or not we exercise, and so on. But also the, the mind has a direct effect on the heart. It's not just that stress can constrict your arteries, causing a heart attack. The human pharmacy can also be involved, creating chemicals that can wreck the heart. During times of stress, your adrenal glands secrete adrenaline or norepinephrine, which in turn cause the blood to clot faster, and that can lodge in the arteries and clog them up. Cortisol is another hormone that's chronically produced during times of stress, and that in turn causes blockages to form in the arteries more readily. Also to counteract this, weekly group therapy sessions to open your heart. But is this just California-style positive thinking? We encourage them to talk about whatever they're feeling, positive or negative. This is not a use your mind to overcome heart disease type program or the power of positive thinking. It's about the healing that can come from sharing emotions of whatever kind in a safe environment. Ornish's trial, preliminary results written up in The Lancet, is a world first. Ornish claims his programs produced more reversal of arterial blockage than any drug and without side effects. This is the first scientific trial ever to show heart disease can be reversed without drugs or surgery. So, how are you feeling, Dwayne? Pretty good. I feel great. Yeah, tired yet? Better, better than I ever have. No, I'm tired. <laughs> to Ornish, loneliness is the hidden killer. There's a sense of isolation that I think underlies in many cases, the emotional stress reaction, which in turn can lead to illnesses like heart disease. There is an increasing body of evidence that shows that in many ways, uh, the impact of social isolation is far greater than the effect of cholesterol or blood pressure or other factors. Onto the mat with the feet together, the palms together. Lock the thumbs, stretch the arms out, stretch up tall, bend back slightly. Fold forward from the hips, keeping an erect spine. But how can Ornish be so sure his the methods are really working on long-term patients like Werner Habenstreit, now on the program for four years? Part of the answer lies here in Houston, Texas. It's here that Ornish's low-tech methods are checked out with high-tech gear costing $16 million. Mildly radioactive fluid with a half-life of seven minutes is prepared and injected into the arteries. Then a scan is taken. End result, a cardiac PET scan telling doctors just how the heart is doing. 
It's a 21st century diagnostic imaging technology that shows very accurately how much blood flow there is in the heart. Now, this is, for example, a picture of Werner Hebenstreit's PET scan showing the whole heart here, the, back, the front, the back, and the two sides, with the different colors corresponding to the amount of blood flow that each region is receiving. White and red mean there's a lot of blood flow. Yellow and green are intermediate. Blue and black means that part of the heart is receiving very little. Now, this is his, his heart in 1988, showing very little blood flow in the side here, which should be mostly white, and even less here, where it's blue and black and, and green. A year later, the same patient shows a much greater improvement in blood flow to his heart. This area here, which wasn't getting very much blood flow before, is getting a significantly greater amount of red and yellow and much less purple and black and green down here. This area here, which should be mostly white, in fact becomes much more white, indicating more blood flow to that part of the heart after a year. This is really a lovely spot. We have to remember to come back to it. Now 75, Werner Habenstreit has improved more than any other of Ornish's patients. Four years ago, he couldn't cross the street because of pain. Now he goes on daily hikes with his wife, Eva, as part of the Ornish program. No more surgery, no more drugs. I'm an extremely poor patient. And I get mad at myself for having pains. I get mad at the world, blame everybody. And I must have been a lousy companion for Eva at that time. I had very, very severe angina pains, the slightest physical effort, and I was in pains. I had to take 14 tablets a day, all sizes, all colors. All of them had side effects and must have affected me mentally tremendously because I was always in a constantly pessimistic bad mood, took it out on others, was mad at myself. And uh, that was the life of a coronary cripple. And I can only say that at times it is difficult for me to remember how sick I was. Um, this is a model of the heart and I thought it might be helpful to show what happened with uh, Werner Hebenstreit's test results. In this artery here that goes to the front of the heart, he had a complete 100% blockage here. Surprisingly, after two years on the program, it opened up to be about 79% blocked. His other artery, what's called the circumflex, um, has shown, after four years, it showed over a 50% improvement or reversal in the blockages. The most severely blocked arteries are the ones that are showing the greatest amount of improvement. And the people who are the oldest are showing the greatest amount of improvement if they stick with the program and continue to follow it. Werner has stuck to the whole program. Each day, he meditates at his desk. The study shows the time spent on meditation correlates strongly to clearance of the arteries. Part of the technique, visualization. You imagine your heart getting better by using images of your choice. I got out of Hitler's Germany in a canoe, which means that I got out of the danger of a concentration camp and even death. Now I use a canoe as a technique in my visualization. I imagine that I'm going down my arteries which formerly were obstructed by all kinds of obstacles, blockages and whatever. And now I imagine that I go down the arteries, a nice current, no obstructions, and now my canoe again is a means of an escape out of coronary heart disease into perfect health. If somebody comes into the emergency room and they're having crushing chest pain, I don't give them a stick of broccoli and tell them to meditate. I use whatever drugs and surgery or shocking the heart or whatever is needed to get a person through a crisis. But to me, that's where the interesting process begins. That's not, unfortunately, where it would end, as is often the case in modern medicine. Ornish's methods are a far cry from orthodox heart surgery, which he himself has practiced. But if other scientists confirm his findings, it could well mean a huge decrease in operations like bypass surgery. Each year in Britain, 
175,000 people die of heart disease. But Ornish says a staggering 95% of this is preventable. He believes bypass surgery just bypasses the real problem, the patient's mind. Besides which, new surgical techniques like angioplasty are not as effective as we might think. With angioplasty, within four to six months, a third of them have clogged up again. What do we do? We repeat the angioplasty. And so five to seven billion dollars a year now are spent for angioplasty in this country. And yet there haven't been any long-term control clinical trials of angioplasty. With heart disease in Britain, as in America, our number one killer, is this the cure for the 21st century? The director of the US National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute has endorsed the strong scientific findings of Dr. Ornish. So why does Ornish think many other doctors are still skeptical? The difference is, is that drugs and surgery fall within the conventional medical model. If we had shown in our research that drug, a new drug, drug X, had the same benefits that this lifestyle program does, I can assure you that every doctor in the country would be prescribing this new drug to their patients. Werner's improvement is all the more extraordinary as he'd always eaten carefully and tried to keep fit. But what hope is there for people like Duane, who'd never done any such thing? He's sure he couldn't have regained his health without inner change. His life caused him such despair, he had to change. It was miserable. I, I hated to go to work. I hated to be around people. I hated to be alone. I didn't like to discuss things with my family. I didn't like to discuss things with uh, other people. I, I, I was a miserable wretch. I just really did not, I hate to put it this way, I didn't like living. I didn't like what life was bringing me. There's what I looked like a year and a half ago. I was 280 pounds. I like to fight. I like to do things to hurt people. In 18 months, He's drastically reduced weight and cholesterol. He's also had a complete change of heart. I probably owe him my life. I no longer run people off the road. I no longer shout at my family. I believe I've fallen in love with my wife all over again. In part two, the human pharmacy and cancer, pain and health. Cancer remains the second biggest killer in the West after heart disease. In the battle to cure it, top Los Angeles doctors now enlist the help of the mind. On their advice, cancer patient Felice Apodaca used mind-based techniques as complementary therapy. Five years ago, she was critically ill with ovarian cancer. I would hate to think where I would be today if I hadn't used this technique. I believe that it may have made the difference between life and death for me. I was terribly frightened. I was frightened of things I couldn't name. I was frightened that they weren't going to get the cancer, that I was going to die. I just, I had nothing more inside me to give. I needed more help. And so I had heard about Bernard Towers and the type of work that he, had, he does with imagery, and I was 
the doctors were, the oncologists were urging me to go see him, and so I thought that I should give him a try, that, that this was something that, that I could do. A professor of psychiatry and anatomy at the University of California, Bernard Taz is a British doctor who believes such methods are part of the future. At one of the world's biggest hospitals, he teaches tomorrow's doctors to treat mind and body as one. This new movement in medicine is not by any means a California fad. Now, this is beginning to be the essential way, I think, that medicine is going to be practiced in the 21st century by collaborative efforts of different kinds of specialists, some of them specialists in mechanical repair work, for instance, some specialists in the use of radiotherapy, some in chemistry, some of them dealing as I deal with both body and mind as a unity. And focus on your breathing. Just be conscious of your breathing quietly in and out. And feel very calm and very relaxed. And now the setting today is you find yourself early one morning walking along the side of a lake and enjoying the peace and quiet. And you notice that there is a jetty, a wooden jetty. The aim, to access the patient's mind through a sort of waking dream. Towers believes this in turn will help activate the human pharmacy, the body's own healing system. And the shoreline is rather uneven. It's not a smooth, circular kind of lake. It's a little irregular kind mm -hmm. of lake. In line with findings of scientists in New York, the therapy seemed to stop the intense nausea that plagued Felice as a side effect of her radiotherapy. These techniques helped me learn a great deal about my body. It helped me learn what was right in my body and what was wrong, and the cancer was wrong. And I learned to push it out of my body somehow. I know it sounds crazy, but it's a feeling of awareness of my body that I, f that I have now that I did not have before. Five years later, Felice is free of cancer. There's no scientific proof of her belief that Tower's therapy held the key to her survival. But if he's so sure of its power, why not prove it? Why not give his therapy to one group of patients and not to another, and compare the results? Most of my patients come to me referred by oncologists or surgeons, and they are referred specifically for help in trying to meet the challenge of their condition and of the therapies they undergo. I could not, in conscience, as a physician, deny that the help that I might be able to give them to half of those patients referred to me in order to use them as controls over the other half. But 400 miles away in Stanford, Northern California, doctors have come up with some astonishing new evidence. Skeptical of unproven treatments, for years Dr. David Spiegel had been doing a controlled scientific trial on women with advanced breast cancer. We began some 15 years ago because we wanted to understand something about how women faced with a terminal illness, coped with it. We wanted to see whether it could be a period of growth uh, rather than decline. And we wanted to see how we could be of help to them in better coping with it. Dr. Spiegel had just aimed at reducing the women's pain and fear of death. The techniques used included hypnosis and counseling. Their effectiveness was tested and proven. That makes it even more Spiegel had never believed the mind could help you live longer if you're that sick. But then something happened to one of his patients that made him look at 15 years of data all over again. We had uh, one woman in the group who was a brilliant woman, wrote books on computer programming. And uh, she had gone to a place where you learn to meditate away your cancer. You picture your white cells killing your cancer cells. And she came back from that trip and was told by her oncologist that she'd had a substantial spread of her illness. She called her counselor back and the counselor said, tell me, why did you want your cancer to spread? Well, fortunately, she was irritated by it. I was irritated by it. And that led us to the idea of following up on what had happened to the women who had been in a support group. Uh, basically, I was certain that it would be a negative outcome study, that we would 
look at the ones who had been helped with the support groups and compare them with a randomized group who had not had the support group, and we expected to observe no difference in the progression of the disease. Spiegel just couldn't believe his own statistics. He held back from publishing them, while experts from the United States and elsewhere checked his figures. Data showed that the women in his support group had survived twice as long, 36 months, as those who just had normal treatment. We were shocked by the outcome. We thought that there would be no difference in disease progression. And so when I first saw that the women randomized to our psychosocial support group, lived an average of 18 months longer than the women who were randomized to the control condition, I was absolutely astounded by it. And what you see is that while initially they were dying at the same rate, these differences begin to emerge at 20 months. By four years or 48 months afterward, all of the comparison patients have died and a third of the treatment sample are still alive. And you can see that this portion of the treatment group lives substantially longer than did the comparison sample. Either by modulating the kind of stress hormones that we secrete, such as cortisol, or by altering the activity of the cells in our immune system, these women may have better mobilized those resources to fight illness. The stress hormones, for example, suppress immune function. So if you secrete less stress hormones, your immune system might be more active. What of the future? As high-tech medicine refines its methods for treating cancer, evidence on the mind's role in cancer is still conflicting. Doctors will want to see Spiegel's findings confirmed in other studies. But Dr. Spiegel believes these are exciting times for medical research. He's in no doubt that 21st century cancer care will still use chemotherapy and radiotherapy. But he also believes it may well be transformed as we come to learn more about what the mind can do to help fight disease. There is controversy, but there is hope. There's much more agreement among doctors that the mind can help to reduce and manage pain. Run by Dr. Norman Sheely, a neurosurgeon, this pain clinic in Springfield, Missouri, is purpose-built. It claims to have made startling innovations in pain control. Besieged by patients with back pain, Sheely set a trend by doing little or no surgery. It hurts a bit when I put in the He's campaigned for 20 years against minutes. doctors who use drugs or surgery when the mind could be used instead to activate the human pharmacy. The biggest problem in this country in medical expense and lost work is the back. And actually, before 1939, when we started operating upon the back, this was not true. So in the last 50 years, we have made back complaints the number one medical monster in this country. How you doing? Fine. Except for washing off the Betadine, we're done. During my training, I saw all of these people who were being operated upon and operated upon and operated upon, and I didn't see any reason for it. And as I began to look at individuals with disc surgery, so-called ruptured disc surgery, I found that not more than 10% of them really even had a truly ruptured disc to start with, that 90% should never have been in the operating room. I was once at a major orthopedic meeting and I was talking, I said, why are we doing this? And a professor of orthopedics got up and said, well, I'm in mean, I mean, oh, Norma, I, you know, I, um, I agree with what you say, but I object to your saying it publicly. Medicine in the 21st century has to deal with the mind. The clinic is somewhere on the frontiers of orthodox medicine, but tests done here indicate time spent on this bed reduces depression and pain. Could this be the human pharmacy at work? The body vibrates to music from 20 speakers, 10 of them implanted in the mattress. Relaxed, the brain may then produce the chemicals, beta endorphins, known to block off pain. And recline if you like, just make yourselves comfortable. Medicine 
or science fiction. Remember, Guided meditation, also aimed at releasing beta endorphins, our own natural painkillers discovered in the 1970s. And close your eyes. So turn your attention to a part of the body where you have discomfort and love it. Focus a feeling of love. Juanita Madel has long suffered from knife-like pains due to an inflamed spine and was paying out $25,000 a year in medical bills. Imagine that you're in your favorite spot of nature, the place where you most like to be, alone. My favorite place in the whole world is this beautiful river that's only a few miles from my house. I always feel at peace when I get, get there. So to me, when I get ready to do my visualizations, in my mind, I go to the river. And I stay there for at least an hour to an hour and a half each day. The pain just completely leaves my body. I do not even know that I have pain at that point. During the last 40 years, physicians have been brainwashed by the pharmaceutical industry to use a drug for everything. But if you are in chronic pain, if the pain has gone on for six months or more, then I consider it malpractice to keep that patient on narcotics or to use major tranquilizers, the benzodiazepine drugs. They can only convert anxiety into depression. I wasn't brought up to believe some of the things that Dr. Sheely was telling me at the clinic to do. I was brought up in a small town and, you know, my doctor would just give us a pill and send us home and that's the only type of medicine that I knew anything about. I didn't know that there was other ways that we could heal ourselves, heal our bodies. Almost everywhere in the world, the whole system is going bankrupt, treating people with drugs and surgery when they should be preventing disease. There's a marvelous cost-effectiveness study showing that when people change their habits, you can cut medical expenses sometimes 70% or more just by adopting good health habits. A preventive medicine scientifically based? Los Angeles scientists are testing healthy old people to see if being happy is the key to long life. Among their subjects, 92-year-old George Cochran. Today, we're going to be doing a study into how your mind affects your immune system, um, looking at how your body responds as you perform a mental arithmetic task. The task involves a serial subtraction task. I'll be giving you a number and asking you to subtract seven from that number. When you arrive at the number following that, subtract seven from that number, and seven from that number, and seven from that number. George Continue Cochran has only been Stop. ill once in 60 years. The, like the test will show the impact of stress on several body functions. These include his immune system. He copes as well as many young people, but it's a test no one can win. Okay. Let's begin. 4,444. 4,437. 4,430. 4,423, 4,416, 4,400, 4,000, 3,000, uh, stop. Start again, 4,416. 4,409. 4, 4, Please 4, try to keep up with the 4, 000, metronome. 50, uh, 90. Two, Our uh, very healthy elderly people with excellent immune function, interestingly enough, also appear to be extremely psychologically healthy as well. By that I mean they're not depressed, not anxious, not alienated, are interested, have lives that are fulfilled, have good relationships, good social support systems, and interestingly enough, from the point of view of, of our society, I don't seem to have significant financial worries, not necessarily wealthy, but at least not worrying where the next meal is coming from. Okay, Mr. Cochran. Well, what we're going to be doing now is drawing some blood to check your immune functions and some hormones as well uh, to compare with what they were before you went through that uh, 
stressful mental task. Now, um, I think we're moving away from a medicine that is only concerned with pathology, in other words, illness, to understand health and what keeps people well, and to realize that mental and physical well-being are really inextricable. George Cochrane's close friend for the last 20 years, Betty, 89. Combined age, 181, and still going strong. Oh. No? One. I play the game, I play cards, I play everything to win, everything to win. I'm very serious when I get into competition. But then when I get through with it, why, it's all over. What keeps him well? A lack of being distressed by life's everyday events, a zest for life, and good relationships. I don't know a better formula. I have 10 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren. They always give me the lift that I need to, get, to carry on. I try to keep up with all the things that goes on in the world and try to help out, do my share and my, my part of, of helping those that need help from time to time. So tell me about any illnesses you've had as an adult. Illnesses? I haven't had any. I had once uh, 30 years ago, I had a hernia, and that's all I've had. No illnesses. None I haven't been tall. to Hollywood. Not since I had the George mind. Solomon, a pioneer in the field, believes the science of the human pharmacy could well change the face of medicine as we know it. But will it? Just how different will 21st century medicine be? I've become disillusioned because the actual clinical practice of medicine is more determined by social and economic forces than by science. It seems to me what we have to do is be old-fashioned and go back to practicing the way doctors did at the turn of the century, when they talked to their patients, when they knew their patients, when they knew what the stresses were at work, how the marriage was working out, what was going on with the kids. Now, if a person isn't paid to talk to his patient, is he going to? Rather, with the remarkable and very valuable technological explosion in medicine in the last 20 years, what is paid for? Procedures, not relationships. If the science of today isn't taken up by the doctors of tomorrow, Professor Solomon believes 21st century medicine will be turning its back on some very ancient wisdom. Wise clinicians for ages have known this. Even philosophers have known it. If you would ask me who was the very first psychoneuroimmunologist, in other words, the person who knew that the uh, body and the mind were connected and could talk to each other in two directions, both ways, I'd say, of course, it was Aristotle. Aristotle said, quote, soul and body, I suggest, react sympathetically upon each other. A change in the state of the soul produces a change in the shape of the body. And conversely, a change in the shape of the body produces a change in the state of the soul. Aristotle had it down cold. It's just been a long time for us to understand the mechanisms that prove Aristotle right. Ironically, the medical efforts to extend life exist side by side in many American states with the mechanism to cut it short, the death penalty. Recent cases in this country have shown how prisoners can be wrongly convicted and capital punishment makes it impossible ever to try to right that wrong. Over the last five years, we've looked twice at the plight of condemned men in the state of Virginia, and many of you will remember particularly the case of Joe Giratano, who was to be executed ten days ago. First Tuesday went back to talk to him in Last Chance on Death Row. Thirty-six states in America operate the death penalty. 
At Mecklenburg Maximum Security Prison in Virginia, 44 men wait to die. I don't look at dying as the end of existence. And I've generally made death one of my close advisors. It's being aware that, that death is right, right there in front of me it makes all of my actions now that much important, that much more important. And if I can beat the electric chair, I will. This is Virginia State electric chair. Time is 11 o'clock. Prisoners brought in and strapped in the electric chair. On February the 22nd this year, Joe Giratano was due to die. On the eve of his transfer to the death house, he gave a final interview to First Tuesday. I still have this one little shred of hope that, that says, you know, the truth matters, um, that being right matters. And I, I hold out hope for the governor to stop it. Um, those hopes may get shattered. Uh, I just don't know. But that's but one way of, of dealing, you know, I just can't give up hope. Okay. Whatever hope Joe had resulted from his appearance five years ago on First Tuesday. The yeah, film sure. highlighted Marie Deans yeah. and her campaign for the men on death row. Funds provided by viewers enabled her to investigate Joe's case. There was a woman who watched that show, became intrigued with Joe, contacted you and then me, and then donated the funds to actually do the investigation that turned up the, the evidence. So that, that show made, a made all the difference in Joe's life. It made a tremendous difference in the life of, of this organization because if you remember, we were we were out. I mean, we were on our last leg. We were folding. And the British people kept us alive for two years, kept this organization going. The money enabled Marie Deans to re-examine the evidence that convicted Joe Giratano. In 1979, he had been found guilty of double murder and rape. He had no idea what had happened, but gave five separate confessions. Well, I understand why I confessed. You know, that I've had a history of taking responsibility for things I didn't do. You know, if, if bad things happened around me, I always took responsibility for them. What happened was really quite outrageous. He was recovering from heavy drug and alcohol abuse when arrested. He was depressed at the time of his trial, and that's been well established, and he was treated for mental illness. He still has signs of having problems in his memory processing. There's no doubt in my mind that his self-incriminating statements must be regarded as totally unreliable. This isn't a case where there wasn't any physical evidence. Uh, all the evidence was there. All of it was tested against me, and none of it matched. And the prosecution hid that. Joe was sentenced to death for the fatal stabbing of Tony Klein and the strangling and rape of her 15-year-old daughter, Michelle. The murders took place at the apartment he shared with them in Norfolk, Virginia. But Joe Giratano could not have made the bloody footprints that led from the body of Tony Klein. The stab wounds point upward, indicating a right-handed attacker. Joe is left-handed, and the use of his right hand is neurologically impaired. He was found guilty of raping Michelle, but the evidence suggests no rape occurred. Out of 21 fingerprints found in the apartment, only one was Joe's. Who left the others has not been revealed. 34 hairs were found and tested. Only one might have come from Joe Giratano. Despite a nationwide campaign, the calls for a new trial to test the evidence were denied. The courts upheld Virginia's laws and turned down Joe's appeals. Right up till the day the Supreme Court denied my petition, I did not believe that they would allow procedure to override the merits of the case. But with just 72 hours remaining to his execution, 
Joe Giratano's life was spared. The governor of Virginia, Douglas Wilder, gave a reprieve for the first time. He commuted Joe's sentence to life with parole after 25 years, and he raised the possibility of a new trial. But the attorney general has refused to reopen the case. While Joe Giratano waits for the chance to prove his innocence, other men wait to be executed. Red lights are on, contacts closed. If it was being an execution right now, I would be able to see the inmate is slumping back in the chair. Blisters would be coming on his legs. Smoke would be coming from the body. Derek Peterson will be the next to be executed. I'm not ready to die. I don't want to die. No. But if it happened, you know, it'll happen. You know, I'm going to put up a fight. I ain't just going to die. I'm going to have to fight. What are you going to do? I ain't got that all together yet. <laughs> but it ain't gonna be just come on, go with us, right? You go to handcuffs, come on, go with us, right? It, it ain't gonna be like that. This machine runs for 55 seconds. Uh, it'll kick off for five seconds and then kick on for 55 seconds. And the victim at the last 55 seconds should be dead. Joe Giratano is free of the death penalty, but he's condemned now to a legal limbo, uncertain when or whether he'll ever have a chance again to have his day in court. His was a case we picked on at random, but the evidence which convicted him, as it turns out, was highly questionable. There are 2,400 men on death rows across America. How many of them face death on the basis of evidence as dubious as it was in the case of Joe Giratano? First Tuesday, we'll be back in April. Until then, good night.